Écoutez, c'est un, vraiment un grand honneur et, et un grand plaisir euh, d'accueillir euh, David Baltimore aujourd'hui. Il va nous parler en anglais, mais il comprend le français. Est, il est francophile, il a séjourné en France. Alors, il est impossible de résumer l'œuvre scientifique de David Baltimore en quelques mots, tellement elle est riche. Elle a commencé très tôt. Il faut savoir que David Baltimore a reçu le prix Nobel en 1975 à l'âge de 37 ans. Et après le prix Nobel, il a continué à faire des travaux absolument exceptionnels. Alors, le prix Nobel était pour la transcriptase réverse, et puis euh, qui a ouvert des champs considérables pour les rétrovirus, mais pour la biologie moléculaire en général. Il a fait des contributions dans de très nombreux domaines qu'on peut à peine évoquer. Euh, je citerai la description de nf B, je citerai les travaux sur les gènes des immunoglobulines, je citerai les travaux sur euh, le, les rétrovirus en général. Euh, une carrière très riche qui s'est associée à d'autres activités euh, non moins importantes, il a été président du Caltech, il a été président de l'université Rockefeller, il a créé le Whitehead Institute, euh, il a également été associé aux conférences d'Asilomar sur la biologie moléculaire, qui ont été qui ont un, 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 qui des événements très importants à l'époque. Il a contribué de façon majeure à la recherche sur le sida. Bref, un chercheur exceptionnel qui a marqué la biologie moléculaire et la biologie tout court du XXe siècle. Alors nous avons un grand plaisir à l'accueillir aujourd'hui et à vrai dire, c'est pour nous une, une sorte de première parce que nous avons décidé de, de recevoir euh, nos associés étrangers par des conférences de ce type chaque année et c'est la première conférence formellement de ce type que nous organisons aujourd'hui et nous sommes très heureux que David Baltimore soit le premier à la donner. Alors je rajouterai pour finir que cette conférence a été organisée en partenariat avec la chaire d'innovation thérapeutique de l'ESSEX, qui tombe particulièrement bien, puisque le sujet que va traiter David Baltimore concerne la thérapeutique, la biotechnologie, et plus particulièrement la thérapie génique. David Baltimore. Thank you very much. I, I greatly appreciate uh, the honor of initiating what I hope will be a very lively series of representations from abroad uh, to the French Academy. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed to be back in this room, uh, which is one of the iconic rooms of, of intellectual life in the world. Um, and even though it's a little awkward <laughs> to give a lecture here, um, because there's a whole lot of people who are seeing me from the back, it, it's like um, give, be, directing a concert in Walt Disney Hall <laughs> in uh, Los Angeles, uh, because the conductor is partial, is of course with his back to a large part of the audience, but then he's looking forward to a whole lot of more people up above. So, uh, and I think the Berlin Philharmonic also is uh, directed in that way. I gave a title of genes as therapies, but in fact, I'm going to talk more about genes as prophylaxis, as prevention, rather than as therapy. Um, and I can't remember why I didn't realize that when I got started. Uh, but genes can be therapies, and we can trace that understanding back to the discovery of, of the fact that DNA is the hereditary material. Because when we found, when it was found, that DNA was the hereditary material and that all of the information to make an organism is to be found in DNA, and that it was a uniform polymer, uniform in the sense that the bonds that hold it together and the general structure of it is repeating, although the code that's built into it, of course, is not necessarily repeating. It was then very simple to imagine that you could add a little piece of DNA or subtract a little piece of DNA or replace a little piece of DNA. 
and correct inherited defects or even improve on it on heredity. And it was e easy to imagine, but it was not simple. Um, it, in fact, when we first started thinking about it, which goes back to the 1970s, uh, it was very hard to see, uh, to the 19, sorry, in the 1960s, it was very hard to see how you were going to get access to the DNA in order to change it. And then in 1970, I was lucky enough to discover the reverse transcriptase as Howard Temin did at the same time. And we, what we found was that there was a class of viruses that were all set up and ready to bring DNA into a cell and to integrate that DNA into the DNA of the cell. Uh, and that's how that, these viruses replicated. But we could easily imagine now that you could take a piece of viral nucleic acid and stitch into it a gene of interest and that that gene uh, then could be put into a, another cell's DNA. And there were other viruses, not only the retroviruses that we had discovered uh, the, the replication system of, but other viruses that offered the same opportunity have come along over time. And so was born a hope of gene therapy. But even then, it proved very difficult because of the technical challenges of just doing the things that we imagine doing. And it's taken a long time. And, and along the way, we've discovered some dangers in fooling around with DNA. Uh, in particular, the, the danger of causing cancer by the insertion of a, a powerful piece of DNA into the genome. So there are some successes today and particularly the treatment of childhood inherited diseases has been very exciting and very impressive. And of course, that's a specialty in Paris with the work of Alan Fisher, Fisher and others. And there are actually now, today, hundreds of gene therapy trials in progress using different integrating or non-integrating vector systems and there have been quite a number of reports of success, uh, but there's still only, a, I think, a single improved gene therapy approved by the regulatory bodies in Europe and none in the United States. Um, there being a lipid storage disease for which an adeno-associated virus um, system works. Now, this is all sort of the standard thinking about gene therapy. It is to replace genes that are defective or to, in some way, counter defects. But you can use gene therapy for a much wider range of activities. And I want to sort of project into the future and show you how we're beginning to think about using genes to improve the body's ability to fight off disease. And we focused on infectious disease, in particular on HIV. And of course, HIV is another Parisian specialty because of uh, Montaigne and company's work in uh, the discovery of that virus. Um, and on cancer. And HIV and cancer have something very similar are very, very much in common. And that is that our body fails to deal with them very well. Our immune systems fail to prevent HIV infection, fail, pre fail to prevent AIDS, and cancers are not controlled well by the immune system. 
But in both cases, you can imagine that the immune system would be able to work. And the methods of gene therapy are methods that um, can improve the immune system, make the immune system capable of dealing with HIV or cancer and other infectious diseases. And so we started a program in my laboratory with a group of, of young scientists, uh, which we call engineering immunity. Now, we're not the only ones by any means who are working along these lines. In fact, there has been enormous success in what's called CAR therapy for cancer in just the last uh, few years. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate on, on other uh, modalities. So we have, in, in a matter of a decade or more now, in, in running this engineering immunity program, generated three different kinds of human clinical trials. We have one planned clinical trial that's just taking time to get through the manufacturing phase. And we've generated two startup companies. So there are ac very active attempts to utilize gene therapy methods for um, for the treatment of, of, of for the prevention and treatment of disease, and I'm only going to focus on one of the programs that we're working on. It's known as VIP for viral immunoprophylaxis. You don't have to remember that. There's no exam after this. Um, and we developed that for the prevention of, of HIV. So let me start with a little bit of introduction about HIV. It's probably unnecessary for the majority of you, but maybe there are a few people who would want this. Um, and then I'll describe what VIP is, how we validated it using humanized mice, uh, which is a, an awful but very descriptive phrase, uh, and then consider the extension of this for other infectious diseases, and then considering one of the most serious unsolved problems in the methodology. So the HIV epidemic started when HIV was transmitted from chimpanzees to humans sometime in the early part of the 1900s in Africa. It became pandemic in the late 1970s and 1980s and spread throughout the world. Uh, what happened in between those two times we can only imagine, but, but you can imagine. Uh, and it is one of many emerging or emerged infectious diseases uh, that have come to the attention and plagued the civilized world uh, in recent times, with Ebola, of course, being on everybody's mind today. But there are still tens of millions of people living with HIV infection, with the, with the specter of AIDS if HIV is not controlled by drug therapies. There are still more than two million infections per year there are 50,000 infections in the United States, and that number has not changed over decades. And there are 1.6 million deaths in, there were in, in 2012, which is the last time I've, I've been able to find data for. So this remains the most serious infectious disease in the world. On the other hand, it's not an easily transmitted virus. It enters the body only by sexual contact or by injection or by mother-to-child transmission. It infects humans very poorly. So if you have a, what's called a discordant couple where one member of a couple uh, is not infected and the other is infected and they have sexual uh, encounters, uh, it's something like one in a hundred to one in a thousand that lead to the transmission of the virus. It is incredibly inefficient. 
It's not actually a human virus. It didn't evolve to be a human virus. It's a, a monkey virus. Even chimp chimpanzees are not natural hosts. So, and you can also show and even predict from just the numbers I have there that it's one or a very small number of virus particles that initiate the infection. Now, we, as a civilization, control viral infections by vaccination. We've done that since Jenner discovered vaccination in the late part of the 16th century. Um, and so a va you would think that with these statistics, a vaccine should be easy to, de to derive for HIV. But HIV is a unique virus. It's different than other viruses. And it's different in a whole lot of ways, some of which I've shown here. There's carbohydrate covering its surface, which is generally not immunogenic, although I'll show you that that view has changed. Um, it uses a two-step method of getting into cells, and it hides away the binding sites for, for cells in deep crevices. Um, and so there are very few anti-HIV antibodies that are able to neutralize the virus and ones that can neutralize the virus are generally very specific to one strain of virus. And there are endless strains of the virus known uh, because every time it infects a new, a, per, a new person, it develops, in a sense, a new strain. Um, and so there are very few, there are some antibodies that work, but until very recently, there were very few that are both broad, that is, able to neutralize most strains, and potent, that is, work at low concentrations. Now, against that background, there seems no question that we need a vaccine. And without a vaccine, we're not going to put this virus under control. So there are people who've said, let's use other methods of prevention, um, and there are other methods that could be used. None of them so far have proven workable, largely because people just simply won't take them often enough and use them consistently enough. So compliance is the issue. There are two arms of the immune system, one arm sitting up here, um, the T cells and B cells. The B cells make antibodies and T cells protect us against infected cells. Um, so you'd think maybe we could make a T-cell vaccine, and that's been a hope now for decades, uh, but it's not clear that's ever going to materialize. So we've decided that you've got to focus on the antibodies. So what's the status of antibodies? Well, there's been an amazing revolution in just the last couple of years in antibodies against HIV. In a whole series of laboratories, Nabel, Burton, and Nussensweig being three of the laboratories, they have found broadly neutralizing, highly potent human anti-HIV antibodies. What happens, what the discovery is, is that people who are infected with HIV actually do make antibodies. But it takes a very long time after they're infected before they make good antibodies. And during that time, the virus grows up into huge concentrations. And by the time those antibodies appear in a person, the person has so much virus that the virus always stays ahead of the antibodies in its evolution. So although these antibodies exist, they don't do the patient any good. And up until a couple of years ago, they didn't do anybody any good until we figured out how to make monoclonal antibodies from patients. And that is creating a revolution. It's creating a revolution in thinking because it says the human immune system is able to make very powerful antibodies, 
And it's creating a revolution in technology because many of us are trying to use those antibodies as a way of preventing virus infection. And if you remember that it takes very few particles to cause an infection and that it does that very rarely, a little bit of antibody on board should be absolutely protective against the infection. And as I'll show you, that is true. All right, so here's a picture of HIV. It has on its surface a small number of spikes, and those spikes bind to human CD30, uh, CD4 cells, um, which are human immune cells. Those are the hosts, and they're the hosts because those spikes are designed to poke a, poke a hole, in a sense, in those cells. Now, up until just two years ago, we didn't know what the structure of that spike was because it was very, very hard to use the modern methods of crystallography uh, and cryoelectron microscopy to determine that structure. But two groups working at Scripps uh, Institute in La Jolla, California, have recently published the structures. One doing it by cryoelectron microscopy, the other by uh, crystallography. And this is the structure of the spike. Uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot. It just means we've gotten there finally. Uh, it's made of two kinds of proteins, GP120 and GP41. It's a trimer, so there are three GP41s and three GP120s in a unit, and that's what this unit is. And it's a triumph of uh, crystallography that I can show you that picture. Uh, this is actually a better picture in the sense because it fills in the uh, molecular structure of the uh, various parts of the protein and it looks more like a solid structure, uh, although it's hard to see into. And you can see the CD4 binding site on, on it marked in yellow. And this is the actual structure with all of the carbohydrate. And remember, we said there was carbohydrate surrounding all of the protein, and there it all is. So that's the real McCoy. This is an old picture, but I, I use it, uh, that shows the spike with some, of, some structural information in it. But I do that to point out that we now have monoclonal antibodies, as I've, as I've said, that bind to this structure, and they bind in different places. So some bind to the CD4 binding site, that important point I mentioned. Some bind up on the top, and they're actually binding largely to carbohydrate, although they bind some to protein. Some antibodies bind only to carbohydrate, and it says that the carbohydrate is highly specific in its structure, much more highly specific than we ever imagined. And some bind down near the bottom, uh, near the membrane of the virus. Um, and that's on the GP41 that, that I showed you. And there are actually many more. In fact, this whole, the, the, this is two different representations of the spike. And the antibodies that bind now pretty well cover the whole spike. So this is a huge amount of exciting technology that we have available to us thanks to the work of, of the Scripps group and, and the many other groups that have isolated these antibodies. All right, we've got them. What do we do with them? So we could try to find a way to reproduce the process that elicited those antibodies in infected people. The problem with that is that even in infected people, only a rare fraction of the people actually make those antibodies, and one person may make one or the other of them. And the reason for that we now know, which is that those antibodies are very highly mutated from what we carry in our germline, what we, what we inherit. And that's a natural process, that mutation process, but it takes a long time because 
it's, it has to be, it's, it's Darwinian. It's mutation followed by selection. And it just takes a long time for the selection to occur. But maybe we could do it. And there are people trying now to design vaccines that will carry through this process of mutation in the body. And you have to use multiple different structures. It's something that's never been done, so it's a, it's, it's a huge challenge. But maybe, just maybe, it will happen. On the other hand, we have these antibodies, and we have biotechnology to make these antibodies. And there are many antibodies being made for therapeutic purposes by many different companies. So maybe we could just make them in large amounts and inject them into people and protect those people. And in fact, we probably could do that. But you'd have to inject them over and over again because antibodies have a finite lifetime in the blood. So we decided there's another way to do this. And that's a gene therapy approach, obviously, because I introduced it that way. And I'm not the only one trying to think about this. Phil Johnson actually predates our work. Uh, he's a, an investigator at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and we're taking actually very similar approaches uh, to use viral vectors to bring the genetic code for these antibodies. After all, they're proteins. There's a genetic code to make them, to bring that into the body to make those antibodies in the body. So we don't need biotechnology to make huge amounts of them. All we have to do is put a gene in there in the right place. And as I'll show you, the muscle is the right place. So we call this vectored immunoprophylaxis, or VIP. So what we're doing is directing the body to make monoclonal antibodies, not eliciting them from the genome. We're going around the immune system in a sense, uh, although we're using the tools of the immune system. Uh, and it's not literally a vaccine because vaccines are things that elicit antibodies. They're not things that they're not antibodies themselves. And we've been trying to do this now for about 10 years, which well predates all of these modern antibodies. And we just had the hope that these antibodies would come along and they certainly have. The initial work, and we, I give them enormous credit, it goes to the Gates Foundation, who supported what was then just a, a dream. The way we do it is with a virus called AAV, adeno-associated virus. And I'll immediately say that the adeno in adeno-associated virus is a statement about the way the virus maintains itself. It has nothing to do with adenovirus. It's a virus into itself. It's called a parvovirus. Um, and the guy in my lab who, who really deserves the credit for having turned this from a concept into a reality is Alex Balas, uh, then a postdoctoral fellow, now an assistant professor in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at the Reagan Institute. And what he saw was that this little virus, and it's just 20 nanometers big, it's a very tiny virus, very tiny as viruses go, um, had tremendous potential. It's non-pathogenic in humans. It's actually non-integrating as a vector, although as a virus it can be integrating. It gives excellent expression of proteins, of, of RNA, which, which makes proteins. It's a DNA virus. You can grow it to very high titer uh, pretty cheaply, and it's very stable, and you can transport it easily around. Its only negative characteristic is that being very small, it will hold only a very small genetic insert. But we pared down the genetic insert sufficiently so that we could make this vector, which has the heavy chain of antibody and the light chain. Antibodies have two chains. Uh, it has a bunch of other things in it to make the genes expressed. It's actually built out of the pieces of five different viruses, which shows you sort of what modern biotechnology is like. Uh, and it works like a charm. Um, 
We've also made a companion virus that uses most of the same material, except it expresses a protein called luciferase, which, whose presence we can see in an animal. And there's an animal, a mouse. And on the, on the left-hand side, we've injected these mice uh, in the uh, bloodstream uh, intravenously with uh, the virus. And the virus has gone to the liver, which is why you see, oops, and I was afraid I have big thumbs, uh, which is why you see luminescence in the liver. And so that looks very good. And in fact, people use adenovirus, adeno-associated virus to deliver genes to the liver. It's, it's a standard gene therapy methodology. But we knew that they'd also put it in muscle, and so we put this luciferase virus in muscle. We put it into the gastrocnemius of the, of the mouse. And what you can see is that it lights up the muscle. And if you look at this scale, it's actually a hundredfold higher expression than what you see in the liver. And so there was no question in our minds that we were going for the muscle and forgetting the liver. There's actually some positive side effects of that, but I'm not going to go into it. So we do the injection, and we follow luciferase appearance, and it peaks in a couple of weeks after uh, injection. And then it stays up at that same high level, out in this case to 64 weeks, which is getting close to the lifespan of a mouse. Um, and basically, from a single injection, this programs the muscle to make luciferase for the lifetime of the animal. So we tried then our antibody encoding virus, and we measured antibody in the circulation in the blood. And again, it comes up, it actually comes up faster, uh, comes to a high level, and stays up within about two or three fold of the peak level uh, for the lifetime of the animal from a single injection. So this is almost the ideal delivery mechanism, giving high levels of antibody over long periods of time. How high? Well, when we optimized the vector, we can get up to between 100 micrograms per milliliter and a milligram per milliliter of blood out as long as we wish to follow it. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to most people, it didn't mean a lot to me at first. Uh, what you need to know is that we carry around with us about 10 milligrams, another log higher, of antibody all the time. It's mixed antibodies, it's various, it, it's sort of our history in, of infectious disease encounters. Um, and so this is about 1 to 10 percent of the antibody load that we ordinarily have. Not a large increase, but a very significant amount as a fraction of the total. Now, will this do an animal any good? So we needed an animal, and we went back to the mouse. The mouse has a serious limitation for studying HIV infection, which is you can't infect a mouse with HIV. Uh, but you can transfer human blood cells into a mouse if, if the mouse is made immunodeficient so it doesn't react against the human cells. So that's why it's called a humanized mouse. And so we take an NSG mouse, which is an immunodeficient mouse, inject human blood cells into it. Uh, the cells that dominate the circulation are, in fact, the CD4 lymphocytes, the cells that are HIV infectable. And so we've now got a mouse with a large number of cells that can be infected by HIV. Uh, and if we follow such an animal and we don't infect it, then 
the fraction of CD4 cells just keeps getting higher and higher. But if we do infect it at zero time, within a couple of weeks, you begin to see a loss of CD30, CD4 cells uh, going down, in fact, to virtually zero. So we have a nice assay system here with a good, a good difference between an infected animal and an uninfected animal. So what we do is to administer the antibody, humanize the uh, immunodeficient mouse that's now making the antibody of interest, challenge it with HIV, whoops, challenge it with HIV, quantify the number of CD4 cells over the next weeks. And if you do that and the animal doesn't have any antibody, we've used the luciferase virus as a control, then almost every animal crashes. There's an occasional animal that doesn't, as shown here, for one animal, uh, and we don't know why that's true, but it's just the nature of biology. That's why biology isn't physics. Uh, but if we use an antibody, in this case the so-called B12 antibody, which is an antibody that was found many years ago and was the best we had, it's not the one we want to have, then we can completely protect all of the animals against HIV infection. And that protection actually lasts for a lifetime. And if you ask, well, are the animals absolutely, do they have absolutely no virus growing in them? So we looked all through the animals using staining methods. We could find no virus in those animals. So as far as we can tell, the animals have sterilizing immunity. Now, I said the B12 antibody is not the antibody we want. And you can see why right in this uh, uh, diagram here. This is a diagram of the genetic relationship of a whole lot of strains of HIV. Um, and uh, if the bar here is red, then that strain is sensitive to the B12 antibody. If the bar is green or black, it isn't sensitive. And you can see there's a small fraction of strains that are sensitive, but most aren't. And that's why B12 is not good. But this paper described a new class of antibodies. It was one of the very first papers describing these highly potent antibodies I told you about. It's called VRCO1 because it was discovered in the Virus Research Center at NIH. And it now neutralizes almost all of the strains of HIV and does it actually at lower concentration. So that was terrific news. And we switched <laughs> to VRCO1. And in this experiment, what we did was to inject into the muscle of of mice, high amounts of, of virus, and then increasingly low amounts of virus, going down here to uh, a, a fraction of the amount that we put in to the first group. And then we asked which of those groups are protected. So if there's no antibody, no protection. If there's a high amount of antibody, total protection. And now we dilute the antibody and we get total protection for quite a while until suddenly we don't. You get a little shift to the right, but no real protection. And from that, we can calculate that if you have on board something like 10 micrograms per milliliter, then you protect animals. And if you have only one microgram per milliliter, you don't protect them. So that's now the therapeutic target that we have to reach. And we assume the same thing will be true in humans. And in fact, we assume that this is an overestimate because our virus challenge is actually a lot of virus. It isn't one particle. But for experimental reasons, we, we challenge with, with many particles. Um, and so I, I would guess that in humans it'll be a lot lower than that. But until we have data in humans, we can't know. Now, once we had shown that, we had a whole series of questions uh, that are more of a technical nature. There are two kinds of HIV. 
we were using one, will the other one be neutralized? The answer to that uh, we found. Uh, can you use actual strains that have infected people? They're called founder strains of HIV uh, that have started infections in authentic people. Um, and can we use VIP when the infection route is not intravenous, which is what we've been doing up to now. I didn't say that, but we have been. But rather at a, at a muc mucosal site. And the answer to all those questions is yes. I'll only focus on the last of those questions because in order to um, ask that question, well, can you use a mucosal challenge, we had to change the humanized mice that we were using. And we adopted a different protocol that it was not our invention, it was other people's invention, uh, in which you make what's called a BLT mouse. Um, and you do that by, by putting in bone marrow, lymphocytes, thymus. I won't actually describe what you do. Uh, but now you get engraftment for a longer period of time. You get all of the immune system. It's just a much better representation of the immune system in a mouse. Most important thing is it goes to mucosal surfaces. Mucosal surfaces are found in the intestine, in the vagina, uh, in nasal passages, lots of places. And we did an intravaginal challenge of these animals using what's called a low-dose challenge. It's actually not such a low dose. Uh, but it takes repeated exposure to get infection. So if you infect once, uh, you'll get maybe 10% of the animals infected. If you in infect 20 times, as we have here, every week uh, infection, uh, then you'll infect most of the animals. And we asked whether putting antibody on board in these animals, in the same way I described before, would protect them. And the bottom line is it protects them extremely well. So if we look at, antibody, if we look at HIV titers in these animals, almost every animal in the unprotected group has titers uh, between 10 to the 5th and 10 to the 6th per milliliter. Lots of virus. A couple of animals still didn't get infected after 20 exposures. But if we put, had antibody on board, then uh, they were absolutely protected, just as we had seen by intravenous injection. So with that, we stopped doing experiments in animals and said, it's now time to transition to humans to see whether this kind of technology can be used in humans. So we've teamed up with a vaccine research center at the National Institutes of Health to do clinical trials. We've already met with officials from the Food and Drug Administration uh, to discuss our trial design and other details. They're comfortable with our moving ahead. In fact, Phil Johnson's also moving ahead um, with a, a somewhat different uh, trial. Uh, we have begun manufacturing virus for the trial, but it's taking us a long time, and I'm frustrated. Uh, I'm, I'm a molecular biologist. I loved it when I worked on bacteriophage, and I came in in the morning, set up an experiment, and got an answer by the next morning, um, and waiting years before you can do an experiment is not my idea of fun, but uh, it is the nature of, of clinical investigation, and I understand it. What kinds of questions are we going to ask? Well, the biggest question is about safety. There's, we have no reason to doubt the safety of this. We've injected very large numbers of mice. We've never seen a problem. Uh, but of course, mice can't talk, so we don't know how they're feeling. Um, and the other question, and the really important scientific question is, can we get the levels of antibody that are protective, that we, that we believe should be protective? And if so, then we'll go to actual trials of protection. And I leave the story at that point, unfortunately. 
Now, it occurred to us very early on when we were getting positive results with HIV that this might work for other infectious diseases. This should work for other infectious diseases. And most infectious viruses are controlled by vaccination perfectly well, and there's no reason for us to get in the business. Mumps, measles, chickenpox, smallpox, polio, those are all under control with vaccines. Vaccines are cheap and easy to make and have been tested and are known to be safe, and I'm not going to try to compete with them. But there's one vaccine that we all should take, which really is not very effective, and that's the influenza virus vaccine. And it's not effective because influenza virus can stay ahead of what we're doing, uh, and it's not effective because older people specifically, and I do note that this group has a subsection of older people in it, uh, to which I feel very akin. Um, and I, I, I no longer take a, an influenza virus vaccine because I've seen the data, and it really is not likely to be very helpful to me. Um, or, for instance, malaria, where a vaccine has not been possible, or hepatitis C, where, there, where a vaccine has not been possible. So since this procedure gives you a very cheap and stable product, uh, it could be used in the developing world. It could be used for developing world diseases like malaria. So Alex teamed up with another guy in my laboratory, Jesse Bloom, uh, and a very good technician. Uh, and we made a, uh, an equivalent virus for protection against flu. Um, and I'm not going to go into the reason for that, but this is the spike on the surface of flu virus. That spike um, has, at all the places where you see red balls, those are places where mutations have occurred in the history of influenza virus to protect against the antibodies that are elicited by every year's vaccine. So we get a vaccination, we're protected for a little while, the virus mutates, and we're no longer protected. So those antibodies are not really very useful over, over long periods of time. Sorry. But there are some new antibodies, and those new antibodies bind not up near the surface of the spike, but rather down on the stalk of the spike down here. Uh, and so, and those antibodies are much harder to mutate against um, and, and really quite effective. So we made those antibodies uh, and challenged the animals, uh, protected animals and non-protected animals, with various influenza virus strains. These are three experiments. The red dots are protected animals. The white dots are unprotected animals. One strain is lethal. The other strains give a huge weight loss, and then the animals come back, um, and you get total protection against that. It's not actually sterilizing. We have reason to believe that the virus is infecting those animals, uh, but um, not, a, not enough infection is occurring to, um, to lead to disease. So this is a terrific vaccine, or pseudo-vaccine, um, because it doesn't matter whether the subjects are immunocompetent or not, it doesn't matter what age they are, and we've looked at very old mice. Very old mice, you can inject them the same way as young mice. Um, and uh, so this is a, another possibility. And then I'll just quickly run through some other work. These are all collaborative experiments with other laboratories. Gary Kettner's laboratory has looked at uh, malaria, um, and you can get protection against malaria in the same way. And I won't go through that data because I think you've seen enough of these curves. Uh, hepatitis C virus, I'll just quote you from a, a, uh, an abstract of a paper uh, that the data in that paper shows that three monoclonal antibodies can be delivered using an AAV vector. They neutralize uh, hepatitis C virus across all of the genotypes of hepatitis C, and that these non, uh, antibodies, 
can protect a different kind of humanized mouse having a human liver uh, from HIV, uh, HCV infection. Um, and a guy named Steve Brimajan, without, I mean, he got this, the materials from us, but he did it all himself, showed that you can actually protect animals against cocaine. Um, and again, using mice, uh, using an enzyme which inactivates cocaine. So this kind of, of technology may have very wide utility. The only big problem that I see with it, high amounts of antibody, no problem. The vector doesn't seem to be a problem. The problem I see is what happens if a rare person reacts badly to the high level of antibody that's being put into the, their blood. And we're a very diverse species. If you test a million of us with almost anything, one or another person is going to be different than the general population. So we need a way of reversing this once we've got it in. And we don't have a good, simple way of reversing it. But we do have a proof of principle. And that is that we can use what's called the Cree-Lox system for reversing it. And I won't go into what this is. Either you know it or you don't know it. And it's too late now if you don't know it. But you can put in lock sites into the vector, and then you can put in an enzyme Cree, which will inactivate the vector. And we show here that it will work, and you do inactivate the vector. And you can see it using a luciferase vector in mice again because those last two animals on the right were injected with luciferase virus and injected 100 days later with Cree enzyme producing virus. And it knocked out 99% of the fluorescence. Or you can look at this, which is an antibody experiment in which we've looked at the antibody concentration. You remember I said that the antibody Concentration is maintained at a constant level over time. That's these open circles. But if we inject, after a few weeks, uh, the Cree-producing vi virus, we can knock down the level of antibody, in this case, by four logs. Um, and that we've done a number of times. So there is a way of reversing it, but we've set this up a little unfairly, it's a very tight injection uh, in one place on the muscle, then we flood it later with the second virus. But it does prove that there is a route to reversal. I want to acknowledge that this was done by a group of people, Alex Balas doing a lot of the work and directing a, these three wonderful technicians who uh, now two of them are off in medical school. Um, they, we got a lot of help from Jesse Bloom in the flu work. Lily Yang actually overall directed my uh, engineering immunity program, and then people in other places. Jim Wilson, who introduced us to AAV, uh, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, David Baltimore, and I'm sure that you are ready to answer questions, and there will be many questions. <laughs> we start with the first one. Yeah, this sounds yes. fantastic. So I was wondering, would your parvovirus elicit uh, antibodies against it, which could with not... What, your parvovirus, your AAV virus, yes. would it elicit uh, an antibody response against it, and would that cause limitations? So the, the question is whether the animals will make an, uh, an, antibody, or, or an antibody response to AAV. Now, most of the animals we use are immunodeficient, so they can't make an antibody response. But I showed you, actually, the antibody levels in immunoproficient animals, and clearly, uh, they can 
um, make as much antibodies as immunodeficient animals. So the antibodies are not a problem. How about the viral capsid? I think that's really what you're worried about. And I showed you that we can use a second dose of AAV to deliver the Cree virus in that last experiment, and the animals are still totally sensitive to the Cree virus. So if there are antibodies made, and we would think there are antibodies made, they're at a low level, it's not a very immunogenic virus, at least in mice. Um, and most people, we're using AAV8 here. Most people don't have natural antibodies to AAV8. And so we, we believe this should be uh, able to be used multiple times um, and that people won't be naturally immune to it. Now, when you go to the clinic, uh, what time in the natural history of the disease would you like to uh, use uh, your therapy? Because you could think of an early phase when the people have become seropositive or later phase with the most the more advanced. So it's both a medical and ethical problem. How, what, is your, what are your thoughts about that? Well, our original development of this was as I said in the beginning, not really for therapy, but for prophylaxis. So the people we expect to take this are uninfected. Um, and what we're hoping is, particularly in the less developed world, that we can uh, protect people. And the people who need it are young women in, uh, in Africa, because they're at terrible risk of getting HIV infection. Uh, so those are the people I, I think about. But you could also use this therapeutically, mm -hmm. particularly if you use multiple antibodies. And if you, took, if you took people whose virus was suppressed with drugs down to a very low level, and then get, gave them antibody. And there are a number of people developing that idea. So I, I think it could be used. But in our clinical testing, we're going to, in the first rounds, use both uninfected and infected people who have been protected with drugs. Moshe uh, Yaniv. David, I assume that the AAV DNA is persisting as a circle of DNA. Does it persist in dividing cells? No, the nice thing about muscle cells is that they don't divide. So the DNA does persist in the nucleus of muscle cells, but because they don't divide, it persists for very long periods of time. It is known in humans from other people's work using other genes that AAV can persist for at least 10 years. In, in, uh, and that's not actually in muscle, but it can protect, it can be in, even in liver for a long time because liver cells divide relatively slowly. But in a, if you tried to use this, for instance, in the metabolic system, it would, the, where cells divide very often, uh, it would be diluted out and be useless. What is the risk, what is the risk of the escape? from the action of the antibody by mutation of the target? In, in an infected person, the risk of mutation, mutational escape would be enormous. And you'd have to be very cognizant of that. In an uninfected person, where, as I said, it's really just one particle that's infecting, and that's a sort of standard HIV that we, we know a lot about, uh, the risk of escape is very low because we do get at least apparently sterile immunity. So we're preventing even the first round of infection. Mm -hmm. But one round of infection shouldn't be enough to generate escape from these very potent antibodies. Thank you. Yes. My Thank you. question is just a follow-up. Because yes. if, if you uh, put this uh, gene in a large number of people, as then you may have a selection for, for a virus 
Yes, I can imagine that if if the antibody is an antibody that protects against 95% of strains, and we wouldn't use one that was less than that, that there's still 5%. And so a few people will still get infected, and you could get selection of a strain of virus in the overall population from pre-existing strains that would be um, resistant. Uh, and thus you have to be prepared with viruses that see an orthogonal uh, site on the, on the uh, with, sorry, with antibodies that see an orthogonal site on the virus so that you can attack those with a different antibody. And actually we could use two antibodies um, in, in a protective mode and then we get really to close to 100%. David, is the, do you have enough experience now to exclude the possibility that in some cases you may elicit an autoimmune uh, disease? Well, as I said, I can imagine that in a small number of people, you could, almost anything might happen. Uh, and that's why I finished up with that comment about reversibility. Because I think we need that in order to be really comfortable. David, another question. You mentioned uh, at the beginning of your talk that uh, these uh, highly efficient neutralizing antibodies do not appear early or they do not appear at high titer. Now, how do you explain that uh, all the trials, the attempts to use various vaccines have not led to the production of uh, these antibodies? Uh, of course, which is important because in your case you drive the good antibody response, obviously. But how do you explain the, the failure of other procedures to induce these antibodies? I, I think we can explain that. Uh, these antibodies, as I said, are highly mutated. So they've, the, the immune system has gone through a process of selection uh, by the virus infection of the individual. So over years, and it takes years, there is production of antibody. Re, uh, the the uh, B cells, I'm trying to be a little untechnical, the B cells get back in the germinal centers, get mutated again, get mutated again, get selected again, get selected again. And finally, you come out through that process with a great antibody. If you started with the virus at time zero, um, it would only select the very beginning stages of that process. And then, of course, it would go away because the vaccine is designed to go away. Uh, and so no vaccine would ever get to the point of having stimulated over two years to, to generate these antibodies. S'il n'y a pas d'autres questions, I think we have to thank you again, Professor Baltimore. <laughs>